Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for this very special conversation, ET Dialogues, Nurturing India's New Age Industries. It's very important to talk about India's New Age Industries. As India dreams of the immediate purpose, the five trillion economy, and the larger purpose, we're talking of what? 30 trillion economy and sometimes even more as we head to that 2047. And you know, there are many pit stops way before 2047 arrives. As we talk about it, the larger picture, taxation and regulation, that needs to ensure that there's an environment for growth of those industries. So let me welcome a special set of people who are here to talk about the need for regulation for these new age industries. We have Dr. Avik Sarkar, Senior Research Fellow and Visiting Faculty at the Indian School of Business. Vivan Sharan, Partner at Kwan Advisory. Ramesh Kailasham, CEO at India Tech. And Rakesh Maheshwari, former Senior Director at the Government of India at the MIT. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being a part of this conversation. Thank you indeed. Vivan, if I may start with you, the big picture, the need for regulation, and what should the broad picture be before government? The policymakers, and I'll come to the former policymaker shortly, the policymakers and the way regulatory environment is set up. Look, the need for regulation is obviously debatable in itself. I think the need is for legal recognition of new industries. Uh, regulation has to follow from a close assessment of the kinds of risks and harms that new industries pose. Uh, and therefore, the framing for any regulatory impetus of uh, new age industry should follow from an assessment of whether the harms and risks posed by that industry uh, are unique uh, or have we seen them before. And a lot of this is now in discussion in the context of artificial intelligence. Do our, for instance, does our IPC, uh, the uh, penal code, does it cover uh, the kinds of uh, harms to individuals, the kind of criminal offenses that may be committed using artificial intelligence, or are there some gaps to be filled? The second question that follows is, if there, if there are no existing laws, uh, then what are the templates around the world that we can look at? Um, and the third is, what is the sort of regulatory or legal perimeter that we can reasonably draw around these new age industries? Maheshwarji, how would a policymaker approach the entire issue? We're looking at AI, which Bivan mentioned. We're looking at Web3, we're looking at gaming, we're looking at a whole variety of other new age industries that are coming up. The fact is that we need to look at as to how this new age industry and what are the attributes of this new age industry, which is prima facie internet driven. You are dealing with something which is extraterritorial, which is mostly, which is virtual, which is mostly anonymous. The conventional law making therefore will not work. You, you don't really know, I mean, which way the technology will move, which way the harms will come, and therefore you are working in a highly unpredictable area as well. The laws, the regulations, therefore, need to be also agile. So agility has to be there. Centralized, centralization has to be there. Harmonization has to be there. The ability to get information as and when required has to be there. Ability to deny access to certain activities which are considered unlawful has to be there. But at any given time, what is need to be kept in focus is the consumer, the user, which in the internet world has also got rights, rights to privacy, right to security, right to information. So those rights also need to be taken care of. Dr. Sarkar, areas where the state is slightly struggling to regulate, and that's the global thing, how does a policymaker and regulator balance the need that Mashwarji mentioned about the need for consumers, companies, and the policymakers. The priorities of each country are very different. The businesses has to run, and they should get adequate independence to do their innovation and try out things. So I think uh, regulators can take um, 
a mixed view about say, some of the bodies putting some elements of, um, of managing the risk, but also passing it on to the line ministries. So if you're talking about healthcare, uh, we can talk about say some AI in healthcare happening on the regulations from some ATN, but the Ministry of Health actually takes the calls on what should be allowed in their ecosystem. I think if you take a mixed approach, it will be it will be good to manage. Otherwise, it becomes too much for the one central organization to manage all of these uh, aspects. Ramishi, how can companies be encouraged to innovate when regulation, what kind of regulation do you really need so that companies say that, yes, we'll give it our best shot and we'll try and innovate so that consumers are served better and largely the India story, if I may say so, grows. There have been governments around the world which have patronized the early rise and growth of big behemoths which is why those large corporations are dominating the world today. And governments of the day then realize that maybe if we allow this to grow, turn a blind eye somewhere for certain things, this will create the largest corporation coming out of our world, which will take on the world. So once we talk about technology and related industries and new age industries, it becomes very paramount that my regulation should not stifle innovation to such an extent that peers around the world are able to leapfrog and go further, whereas I chained you down and kept. And that's up, that applies to all the emerging tech. So Maheshwari ji, can India have a roadmap for policy uh, or regulation, you know, the way regulation evolves over a period of time? You mentioned the term agile. What could such an agile regulation be? Does it need to be light touch? Does it need to be more accommodating? What could it be, look like? When we are living in an era which is where maybe over a period of time we also are not really aware of as to which way it will take up or maybe what kind of harms or what kind of growth, for example, the companies can take up. The first thing which therefore has to be followed is the participative policy making wherein the stakeholders are involved and the government must look into the larger issues rather than doing the micromanagement. And maybe you leave day-to-day -day sort of governance to the companies while simultaneously making them accountable. And lastly, have the powers to be able to deny access of a service in case it is hurting the national interests beyond a point. If you just look at the sectors that have been regulated as India has grown in capacity, uh, look at the insurance sector. It happened at the turn of the last century. The regulator came in place. Uh, you have airports. You have some other sectors which similarly, you have the crypto. Crypto is one thing which we've had, in, if I may use the word, in a little bit of an ostrich-like approach. Uh, but then that could be my opinion. So what should be the approach between what we have seen in telecom and in insurance and in aviation and a few others vis-a-vis -vis the new one? Would you like to probably mention specific examples of what such a regulation could look like? There is a very deep lack of research happening in India on these issues. In the absence of that, what we do is that we tend to adapt the global practices onto India, but global practices do not apply to India at all. So I think copying regulations uh, is, is not the way forward. I think we have to understand what our nuances, right? And, and Aadhaar and UPI are very good examples from that perspective, because these are solutions that have been created for India, looking at what our needs are. And we have to also look at frameworks, because there is a a sizable amount who either do not speak in English or they are not very tech savvy, our solutions has to be techno-legal in nature. I think that has to be the way ahead. First research and then solving our problems in our own unique way rather than uh, copying some of the solutions there. I think that's a very deep need that we see. Welcome back. You're watching this special conversation, ET Dialogues, 
nurturing new age industries. We're now talking a little bit about what should be the regulation for something like online gaming. It's important because of the nuances, because of the issues involved, and let's go across to the policymaker in the past. Mr. Maheshwari, give us a sense of how should regulators or the policymaker approach the setting up of a regulator or whether we need one and what should be the approach? As regards online gaming, I would like to go by, first of all, what, for example, IT rules talk about, which is where, for the first time, after a lot of consultation, the central government, along with other stakeholders from the central government itself, from the state government, from the gaming fraternity, from gamers, from children, from parents, from uh, teachers. So with everybody's involvement, certain regulations were introduced by way of an amendment in the IT rules of 2021. The whole aim was that there should be a distinction between what is considered as an allowable one versus what is not allowed. Constitution, judicial pronouncements have already conveyed that wherever there is a preponderance of a skill is something which is considered as a valid business vis-a-vis -vis wagering or betting which is not really allowed. So with these, as I'll, I'll say, the boundary conditions, and simultaneously also, once again, having the users in the, cent center, um, uh, in the center, wherein addiction, responsible gaming, are the two considerations, the most important considerations, which also need to be kept in mind. And therefore, the government came up with a ideally an easy to implement and easy to manage kind of regulations wherein certain responsibilities were created for the valid online gaming platforms at the first level, including certain aspects of transparency. Then of course, a middle layer sort of a regulatory framework, which is a industry driven itself, an independent self-regulating bodies which can ensure that there is no bias and which can ensure, once again, the, the uh, accountability, the responsibility, the fairness, the uh, non-addictiveness, and maybe a, a secure kind of platforms which is being offered by the online gaming service providers or the platforms. And the role of government comes only in those cases where an illegal activity is being performed an unlawful activity or a high risk activity is performed where maybe in some cases they can talk directly through the layer two and layer one, but in other cases come up with certain, uh, I'll say a mechanism so as to deny access. I'll still prefer that while a full fledged law, a central law once again is made the IT rules with an amendment of 2023 should be made operational in one way or other, whichever way. What should be the process where the consultation with various states and other stakeholders, industry stakeholders, so that we go about with the right approach and it's widely consulted? If you take this sort of uh, state level sovereignty thing to the extreme, you can get very absurd outcomes like you have in Germany. Germany has some upwards of two dozen data protection authorities equivalent within the country. And as a result, you have different jurisprudence arising from different regions of Germany and different rights enjoyed by different stakeholders in, in the context of privacy across the German landscape. And that's certainly not something that's conducive to a creation of a national market or discovering a common conception of what it means to have a modicum of consumer welfare or user welfare online. Somewhere between uh, involving states in a discussion to think about what, what a future model law for administering um, subjects like gaming where there are these overlaps could look like and gambling in particular. Uh, as well as keeping the uh, North Star of 
a degree of standardization when we talk about anything which is digital, which is a digital application uh, in mind, so that we don't create a Europe-like scenario where basically all digital regulation comes from a point of insecurity vis-a-vis -vis Americans, where American apps dominate the European landscape, and no matter what the Europeans do, they can't seem to reverse the clock because they use, they're used to the same trick uh, to solve this uh, problem, which is more regulation, more prescriptiveness, more fragmentation of the European market which is antithetical to the vision of European Union in the first place. So let's not go down that road when we think about various subjects in the digital space. Okay. Dr. Sarkar, uh, how do you think should this conversation, should this consultation go around with the states? Because they're equal stakeholders. Well, I think that's, uh, that brings an interesting uh, aspect to the whole discussion. And uh, the harms that we are talking about when we talk about online gaming, uh, as um, Rakesh ji highlighted them, uh, is about one of addiction, and the other one is more on on whether it's a betting versus a game of skill or game of chance, and and how these aspects are looked into are are very important to give a black and white answer to them. Till the point we do consultation based on individual opinions, I think we will be in a perspective that, okay, each a state can have a perspective of their own, whereas the center can have their perspective on their own. So I think uh, talking about, uh, about getting into some deeper study will be the approach to go about it. Uh, but I think if you see also, there is uh, no common consensus on uh, these issues internationally. I just take the in example internationally so that you can get a sense about how Indian states can also align. If you look at online gaming, there are countries like China and South Korea which has put sing very simple limits like time limits. Like this game cannot be played between say 12 in the midnight to 6 in the morning. So, so time limits have been put by these countries. They also have put very hard limits on the amount being paid. Whereas if you look at countries like UK, they have put it uh, more on an awareness level and users can, um, can be made aware about what the risks are, what the harms are, and they can take, a, uh, uh, take their own uh, aspect and their own role going from there. I think this techno-legal aspect is what I think the, the, the center can discuss with the state. Instead of going on with say hard numbers and dis going like either this way or the or the other way, like if all states agree, we can always take help of the technology and the technology and then when I talk about techno legal framework, it's about the framework ensuring that if a person has say played a game for say one hour or if you have the person has spent say above a threshold of X amount rupees uh, on that day or on that month, you give those um, alerts to the person on the platform and these has are things that are that I call them as like techno legal because it's a part of the app. So Ramiji, we, so we try to get a sense of what the consultation could be for the gaming. Now, just to widen that, because you consult with so many companies and also on the board of some, so that sense of what kind of consultation should governments do with companies around some of these emerging areas, which could ultimately result in that the thing that Vivan mentioned, about doing it right, learning from the mistakes of others. What could those be? Would probably you, your points on that? It's interesting because online gaming again suffers the same set of issues which any other consumer internet tech suffered. People look at where is the harm coming from and in order to rush to address the harm, are you trampling on innovation? Now where the states come in also become important because states jurisdiction is on gambling and betting. Now, if the states start looking at online gaming with real money as gambling and betting, we have a problem of trampling over. And then you have got the actual online gaming and gambling and betting platforms who operate overseas but can easily transgress borders and operate in your country without paying a penny of tax. So the question is, where do you ring fence and draw the border? Because you block one IP, they come back as another IP, just like you had the asuras of the past coming over with a drop of blood. So you could have those kind of examples coming in. So the question that comes in is, in this scenario, all the new age children of the internet who are wanting to behave legitimately and wanting to be governed, regulated, 
their business does get affected by the conventional gambling and betting folks whom the government wants to regulate, whom the states have jurisdiction to regulate, but are unnecessarily or probably unfairly applying that logic on the new age economy companies, which is what the central government effort to create these guidelines and rules helped. Now the question comes in is what next happens? Jurisdictionally, if you are able to work out a mechanism that whitelist to say, this is the large framework and set of guidelines. If you comply with this, you are on this side. If you are not, then obviously you are not on this side. I'm not saying you are on that side. But therefore then this set of people get regulated, get support on innovation. There is a growth matrix which helps them out, that helps them carve out and grow from India to the world. Uh, because it is also important for India to look at, are we creating those large uh, companies which innovate and come out of India to the world? Or are we regulating them so much that they are stuck in within the borders of India and struggling to operate within the states? So I think that collaborative mechanism is very critical to have. Anything of such nature which is coming from the center and followed by the states is the way forward. So long as you create that demarcate that line that states regulation should not interpret them in a different way in their own convenience or for that matter taxation should not be applied on them in the manner in which a conventional uh, target audience of yours, you wanted to apply it on, but now you are conveniently adding a larger constituency to it. I think those all get addressed out of this. Ivan, would you like to add to that? On employment, what is the potential of uh, not doing good by our industry? We've seen the potential for harm before when the state reneges on this responsibility. For instance, in the case of the smartphone sector, when we retrospectively taxed Nokia, we set ourselves back by about two decades in smartphone manufacturing. Today, we are at the same level where we were at in 2013 by virtue of Apple exporting $2 billion of phones from India. Nokia was doing that in 2013. This is how long the journey of recovery has taken. And so many persistent political battles around this recovery journey. Do we have the time, the luxury to afford to do this to industry after industry where we're trying to impose penal taxation regimes where we want short-term, medium-term windfall gains for the exchequer, but long-term erosion of employment prospects. And gaming is one example, crypto is another. Why throttle the entrepreneurial spirit of our people? Taxation has to serve a larger objective, and we can look back in our own history to see when all we have uh, compromised that. On the investment front, we need, need not look any further than a country that sometimes we feel envious of and at other times we should learn lessons from, which is China. What is happening in China today as a result of the penal regime that the Chinese uh, state has put on technology companies? It is seeing 30, 40 year lows in foreign direct investment. It's unprecedented. And this is an opportunity for India obviously to leverage, but it's also an opportunity to see what happens when you try to think about the coercive state power, you know, try to take it to the maximum just because digital industries are so vulnerable. They are the most vulnerable industry. You can shut down a digital business overnight. So unless we have a regulatory regime or a legal clarity around sectors where we know who we are regulating first and foremost, if you don't know that, then we are harming even our own innovators by shutting them down overnight. Unless we have that and we think about the template that we've all I think in one way or the other discuss that establish the harms and the risks, see if it's covered by a law or not, is there something exceptional about that space or have we seen that picture before and then figure out what can we actually enforce when we think about a new le legal or regulatory regime and whose help do we need to uh, actually make effectuate that regulatory perimeter. Thank you so much gentlemen for being a part of this conversation. Mm -hmm.